This screencast continues the discussion of isothermal reactor design. Uh, if we have isothermal gas phase packed bed reactors, frequently there's a pressure drop. And we should account for that pressure drop in our concentration expression. It turns out that this is a, a case that is amenable to direct analysis, so I'm going to talk about it. But it can be used in general for any situation where you have a catalytic reactor and it has a packed bed and we expect there to be a pressure drop which is going to affect the concentration of a gas phase reaction. So if we go back to our concentration expression, which was discussed in the last sub-screencast that went along with this topic, um, the concentration of a species is given by the inlet concentration of A, the reference compound, times theta, that's the ratio of the initial concentration of this species to A, plus a stoichiometric coefficient for that species times conversion over one plus epsilon times the conversion, so that accounts for volume changes due to reaction, is what epsilon does for us. But if the pressure is changing, the concentration depends on pressure, so it should depend on P over P naught. And so, for instance, if we have a second order isothermal reaction in a packed bed reactor, this is the rate expression we would expect. So we have this pressure dependence. And if we write the balance equation, the rate of change of conversion with respect to the weight of catalyst should be given by the rate of consumption of A per unit of mass divided by the initial concentration times the initial volumetric flow rate. And if I put in my rate expression, this is what I end up with. And the main thing that I don't know here that I need to determine is this expression. So what is pressure? And we could ask different questions. But what we're going to ask in this case is, how is the pressure related to the weight, or how far we've gone through the catalyst? So to answer that question, we first need to consider the fluid mechanics associated with flow through a packed bed. And the pressure drop in a packed bed can be described using the Ergun equation. To remind you from fluid mechanics of what this looks like, if that's where you saw it, um, this is a classic way of describing a packed bed. And it's really just saying that the pressure drop, so the rate of change of pressure with respect to position, and this would be for a reactor where we're moving along from the inlet to the outlet. So we have a higher pressure at the inlet, and then we're interested at some point in this reactor in the pressure, and this is as a function of Z moving in this direction. So here we're saying what's, what's the differential change in pressure with respect to Z. And it's given by, and it, we expect it to drop as a function of position. There's a constant, and it also depends on the density. So we can multiply by the initial density over the current density because that may change due to reaction. So for beta naught, it depends on several characteristics of the, the packing. So we have the superficial mass velocity, um, the initial density, GC, which is the gravitational constant, um, the particle diameter for the packing, the uh, void fraction, that's, that's phi. Sorry, it's written as F down here. It should be a Greek letter. Um, it depends on the viscosity of the gas. Um, and I guess that's all the variables. So this is, again, this is a classic relationship, and it works for a lot of packed beds. So we can use it in our problem. But notice that what it comes down to is essentially that we have this constant beta naught that characterizes the packing, and that describes how the pressure changes. Uh, because the mass is conserved, we would expect that at steady state, the product of the density times the volumetric flow rate uh, remains constant, because that's basically the mass flow rate. Um, and if we take earlier volume flow considerations into account, the volumetric flow rate should be the initial volumetric flow rate times the initial pressure over the final pressure times T over T naught times the total molar flow rate over the initial total molar flow rate, which allow us, uh, allows us excuse me, to write an expression for the relationship between the current density and the initial density. Um, so another thing that we know is that the total catalyst weight, W, is given by 1 minus phi, where phi is the, the void fraction, times the cross-sectional area times Z, times the density of the catalyst. So with that in mind, we can put all that together and say how pressure drop changes with respect to weight of catalyst, based on the Ergon equation and all these considerations above. So we have negative B naught over the cross-sectional area times 1 minus phi times the density of the catalyst. These are all constants multiplied by P naught over P times T over T naught times FT over FT naught. 
if we define y to be p over p naught and alpha to be this combination of constants that appears at the beginning of the equation, we can say that dy over dw is equal to the opposite of alpha over 2 times y times 1 plus epsilon x times t over t naught. And in general, it's necessary to solve simultaneously for dx with respect to w and dy with respect to w. So we get two differential equations. It's straightforward to solve them simultaneously. So we can do that. And that's as far as we would need to go with our analysis. But it turns out that if we have an isothermal reaction, so t over t naught equals 1, that's what we mean by saying that. And if epsilon equals 0, so that 1 plus epsilon x equals 1, we do have a solvable differential equation. So in that case, dy with respect to w is negative alpha over 2 times y. So that can be integrated, and we get that y is equal to 1 minus alpha times w to the 1 half power. Assuming that y equals, well, what should it be? It should be 1 at w equals 0. So this is our expression for y. And in that case, if we have an isothermal reactor that doesn't have a volume change due to reaction, we can insert that pressure drop expression. So that's here. So now we have a differential equation for x as a function of weight of catalyst that depends on x in one term and w in another term. So those variables can be separated from each other. And this is actually squared, so that square root and the squared are going to cancel each other out, or it's the inverse operation. So we end up with dx over 1 minus x squared on one side of the equation and 1 minus alpha w dw on the other side. And if we integrate this from the conversion being 0 at um, w being equal to 0, then we end up with this expression. So we actually do have a solvable form of the differential equation for an isothermal reaction with no volume change when it's second order and it happens in a pack bed reactor. So we can determine the weight of catalyst required to get to a certain conversion or the, catal or the conversion we would get for a given weight of catalyst. So that uh, is a solvable example and it illustrates how we handle pressure drops just due to flow in a packed bed, which can be described by the Ergon equation. There's an example in Fogler which gives a numerical solution for a non-constant volume reaction. You can imagine how that works. Basically you have to go back to the differential equation from a few slides ago and solve that simultaneously along with the conversion equation. So that's one consideration that might be an extension of what we know about ideal reactors. Um, another type of reactor that we can potentially model that's a little bit different from a classical uh, PFR is a membrane reactor. These are of interest for the idea of process intensification where we have a reaction happening at the same time as separation because this does a few things. One is it may save capital cost because you have two separations happening at one time. But more importantly, if, if your reaction is thermodynamically limited and reversible, getting rid of a product can help to drive the reaction forward. So there's a module on Fogler CD-ROM, but I'm just going to talk about an example of a membrane reactor here. So you may, for example, have a feed of um, C6H12 that's going to react, and it's going to be um, dehydrogenated, but we need to get the hydrogen out of the reactor in order to drive that forward. So either we can have a catalyst inside of a tube which has is surrounded by a membrane so that hydrogen goes through that membrane and gets removed, or we can have the feed going in and then both the catalyst and the membrane in one place. Either will result in process intensification. Um, if we think about the, the first case where we have the catalytic reactor and then a membrane surrounding it, we can analyze this as a plug flow reactor, but we need to modify our slice balance. So now we have a flow rate going in at point V, that would be at this point, and a flow rate leaving at, at the other end of this little slice. We have the rate of reaction of that species within this control volume, but we also have a rate of permeation. And that's the rate of removal, R sub I, multiplied by the volume. So we'd express this as the rate of removal per unit of volume. Um, and if we just use this expression and we take the limit as delta V, the, the differential volume, approaches zero, we would get that the rate of change of the flow rate of species I with respect to the volume is given by the rate of reaction, which is what we always have, minus the rate of removal due to the membrane. 
And so as long as we know something about the transport, the relative transport, through the membrane, we can describe our system. Um, we usually assume that the membrane is selectively permeable, otherwise why bother with a membrane? And of course you can be as realistic as you need to be. But for simplicity, we're going to make very simple assumptions that either one species is completely permeable at a certain rate or it's totally impermeable to that species. The flux is the driving force, so that's the, mol the moles going through the membrane per area per time. And it depends on the membrane, but we can assume a driving force. So we're going to assume that we have some coefficient, which I'll call H prime, multiplied by the concentration inside the reactor minus the concentration on the permeate side. The volume is pi d squared, where d is the diameter of the inner tube of this membrane reactor, times delta z, the thickness, um, divided by 4. And the area of the membrane is given by pi d times delta z. So because of that, the rate of removal is given by the transport coefficient times pi d delta z over pi d squared delta z over 4. So the dimensions are going to mostly cancel out. Um, and we have the concentration difference across the membrane. So that can be simplified, and we end up with a parameter that I'll call h, which really has the um, transport parameter as well as the diameter of the reactor um, included, but it depends then on the concentration difference going across the reactor. And a lot of times we can assume that there's a sweep gas on the permeate side and it flows quickly, so the concentration on the permeate side is approximately zero. So that leads to a very simple expression for the rate of removal through the membrane. So if we consider, for example, A going to B plus C, where B and only B is selectively removed by the membrane. And for now, it's, it's irreversible, so we can just look at how much that enhances the rate of reaction. For A, nothing changes. It looks just like any other situation. Um, and for B, nothing changes. So we have you know, this rate of, of uh, removal of C, or of generation of C, sorry, due to reaction. But for B, we have an extra term, and that's due to removal through the membrane at a particular rate determined by the permeability. So, um, so there's this example where we're looking at ethyl benzene making styrene. And if this is a reversible reaction of A going to B plus C, we can imagine that we have a membrane that's permea permeable towards B, which represents hydrogen. And we would like to see how the membrane affects the, uh, the performance of a plug flow reactor. So we have a particular equilibrium coefficient. Notice it's not very large. So this is a very re reversible reaction. And this is at 227 degrees Celsius, which is the temperature we want to operate this reactor. We have 10 moles per mole of pure A entering at 8.2 atmospheres. And so I should be moles per minute, I believe. Um, and 227 degrees Celsius. The forward rate coefficient is given. And the permeation coefficient, H, is given. So with all of that information, we can describe our differential equations. Now the rate of consumption of A, because it's a reversible reaction, is given by the forward rate coefficient times the concentration of A minus the reverse, which is 1 over the equilibrium coefficient times the product of the two products, concentration of B and C. And we can write the concentration of a species as the, in the total concentration times the molar flow rate of that species over the total molar flow rate, where the total molar flow rate is given by the sum of all species. The initial total concentration we can find from the initial pressure um, and the gas constant in the initial temperature. So that's 0.2 moles per cubic decimeter. The initial flow rate is 10 moles per minute. And with that information, we can write our differential equations and, and integrate them. If there were no membrane reactor, we could analyze the equilibrium conversion. And if we take the equilibrium coefficient given and the initial total concentration given, that would work out to be 0.447. So the reaction would not go to completion. It would go to, I mean, a completion here would mean less than 50% conversion. However, with a membrane reactor, we can get significantly greater conversion. So for example, if we look at the, con the flow rate of A, whether it's a membrane reactor or not actually doesn't matter. We get um, this curve. So A goes away. But if, um, actually, this is not comparing it a plug flow reactor and a membrane reactor. This is with a membrane reactor. A continues to react and B continues to go away because of the, the membrane reactor and that drives the reaction forward to produce C. So here we can see that we have this loss of B that's just because of the membrane reactor. So basically it's transport limited in that region. And so we can continue to drive the reaction.